I'm going to be going over some questions from 7.2 for you. And the first one I've selected is one that involves a normal quantile plot, which was introduced to us back in chapter two when we looked at different types of statistical graphs. And it's been a while since we've seen one, so let me remind you what, of it, what it is. It is when you take your data, each of these blue dots represents a data value. If they fit this red line fairly well, then we say the data is normal. It follows a bell curve pretty well. And if it doesn't, then we say it has a departure from normality. The first thing you have to do anytime you're asked to construct a confidence interval is to determine whether or not the central limit theorem does hold. So that's what we're doing here, and we can see that the data is not normal. So let me remind you exactly what the central limit theorem says. If you were to take your population and sample um, multiple times a certain size over and over and over again, and you were to do that until you had all of the possible sample means, all the different groups of n, then the population of sample means would be bell curve. And that is what we need to be true in order to proceed with any of the methods for 7.2. So we do have an out, let me get back to the problem here. We do have an out, even though we see that our, our data clearly has a departure, a pretty, pretty severe departure from normality. If we can figure out that we have enough sample data, we can still say that the central limit theorem applies. Here we have a sample of 17 values. So the sample size is not large enough to um, get around the fact that we have a departure from normality. So actually the central limit theorem does not hold and it says no, there's, I'm going to work this as a student so we can read through them. So we would go, okay, so no it's not normal um, and the sample size is too small. So it would be this answer because it says the sample size is too small and the data display a departure from normality. The other option was no, the data appear to be normally distributed, but the sample size is too small. That would never be the answer because um, if the data is normally distributed, it does not matter what your sample size is anyway. But C is the correct answer for this. And then part two, um, it says <clears throat> the choices all are starting with um, the phrase, the central limit theorem holds, all of these options A, B, C, and D so we can eliminate all of those options, it has to be E. The central limit theorem does not hold, so neither distribution applies. Okay, so if the central limit theorem applies, then you can go on to determining whether you want to use z-scores or t-scores to construct your confidence interval, um, but you don't even make it that far if your central limit theorem does not hold. Okay, right, let's look at a similar question. Uh, it says, assume that we want to construct a confidence interval. Do one of the following as appropriate. Find the critical t value, the critical z value, or state that neither distribution applies nor the t distribution applies. Okay, so the confidence interval is 99%. Sigma is not known. And the histogram of 60 player salaries is shown to the right here. And this time we're given a histogram which is another type of statistical graph that we learned about earlier in the term. And it's basically a bar graph that shows you the shape of the data. So this data looks pretty much right skewed, very severely right skewed, definitely not bell shaped. So we can see there appears to be a severe departure from normality here. But the good news is that we have a large enough sample size of 60 values. So the central limit theorem does still hold. And since the central limit theorem holds, we can go on to the next step of determining whether we want to use t-scores or z-scores for a critical value. So uh, we'll read again this part of it. The 99% confidence level where sigma is not known. Okay, I want to focus in on that. Sigma is not known, so that means we're going to do t-scores. And then we can use the rest of the information, the fact that we have, are trying to do a 99% confidence interval, that we will use in order to figure out the t-score that goes with this. So let's try and figure that out now. So what we had there was 
we've decided that we're going to be doing a t-score we're looking for critical values remember that all confidence intervals are two-tailed and so that means that you'll have a t-score on each side uh, with alpha half to the right This is the positive T-score with an area of alpha half to its right. And to figure out what that area is, we start with the confidence level, which was given for this problem to be 99%. which means that alpha is 0 0.01 and that means that alpha half is 0 0.005 so this area is 0 0.005 and uh, we also need degrees of freedom which is based on your sample size remember our sample size was 60 so the degrees of freedom which is always n minus 1, will be 59. So with um, t being having an area of 0, 0, 005 to its right with 59 degrees of freedom, we just need to look that up in the t table and we can also find that answer using an Excel function. So let's look at both. We'll start with the table. Here's the t table. This is in your reference packet. And we'll look down this column that says degrees of freedom. So we're looking for n minus 1, which was 59, or the closest thing to it. And then we want to look in the column that has 99% confidence, which corresponds to a single tail of 0 0.005 or a two tail total of 0 0.01. So it's this column here, and that means that our the answer is going to be 2.660. And let's see how we can find that answer also using Excel. To do this, we will start as always with an equal sign. And we'll use, we'll start by typing in T for T distribution. And this is a two-tailed T distribution. Um, I've chosen the wrong one though, let me back up. I want the one that says inverse because I'm looking for a boundary, not for an area. So I don't want any of the ones that say DIST, those all give you, those mean probability distribution function, which means it gives you an area. The ones that say INV stands for inverse, meaning that we're starting from an area to find a boundary. And then I will use the two inverse the T inverse two tails. Two T means two tails. So I will give it the full probability, <laughs> my significance level, a point zero one, degrees of freedom 59. And you can see that I do get 2.662 uh, two approximately if I round it to three digits. So using our T distribution, this way, I get 2.662. If you were to use, um, say, T inverse without the 2T on it, you would give it a left hand area and since you're looking for the positive version there's two ways you can go about this you can put in a point zero zero five and then the degrees of freedom and then you have to recognize that you would want to use the positive version of this for your critical value to calculate your margin of error or you can actually put in one minus that which would be point nine nine five and it'll give you the positive version. So 
any of these ways works, but it's great to have the table as well so that you can make sense of everything you're doing, make sure everything is aligning, it's easy to get confused. So it's really a good idea to do things multiple different ways to kind of cross check yourself. And so let's look at how they want the answer entered. It says round to two decimal places as needed. So let's do that. Um, that means that either way, whether I used Excel or I used the table, when I round it, these both round to, um, they both round to 2.66. All right. Right. And then the next one here, um, once again, we see right skewed data over here. Uh, we do have a large enough sample size, so the central limit theorem applies. And now we can figure out whether we want to use a z-score as our critical value or a t-score. So then we keep looking over and we see that sigma is actually given this time. So sigma is known. That means we use z-scores. And then we just use the confidence level to figure out what z-score that should be. So we'll do that. So with n equals 58 and a confidence level of 95%. Okay, so with n equals 58 and the confidence level, actually let me just change that to red. This means that my alpha will be 0 0.05, and that means that the area in each tail is 0 0.025. And when I look up When I look up the z-score, it's going to give me the negative z-score because remember, we're only using the negative z-score table for this class. So I'm going to go over and look at my negative z-score table. This is all in your packet. And I'm going to look up an area in the center of the table of 0 0.025. Let's see, where is that? right here, okay, 0 0.025, and then work my way out to a z-score of negative 1.96. So I've just found negative 1.96, but the one that I'm going to use to calculate my margin of error is the positive version. We can also use Excel to find this. So just like we did for the t-scores, we can do this for z-scores using norm.inverse. And I'm going to put the probability in as 0 0.025, the mean of 0, and the standard deviation of 1. And it gives me the negative 1.96. And then I, of course, again, know to change it to positive. There we go. Oops, I've got a commercial on my music. OK, now. We're going to do another one, but this one does not have a graphic with it. It says again, assume that we want to construct a confidence interval. Do one of the following. Either find the critical T value, the critical D value, or state that neither of those applies. Here are summary statistics for randomly selected weights of newborn girls with N equals 222. So that's a very large sample size. That means I'm not worried about the central limit theorem. I know it applies. Even if the data was not normal, I have a large enough sample that it'll work out just fine. 
So now I know I can proceed and figure out if I should use T-score or Z-score for my critical value. I see that I've been given S, which is a sample standard deviation. That's not the population standard deviation. Therefore, sigma was not given, sigma is unknown, and I am going to do a T-score. So once again, I will need my sample size, 222, and the confidence level to find my T-score. So with N equals 222, Also, I've been given n equals to 22, which means that my degrees of freedom will be 221. So now, to find my t-score with an area to its right of 0.025, I'm going to look in my table. For degrees of freedom, 221, or the closest thing to it. So the closest thing to 221 here in this table is 200. And then I want to line it up with 95% confidence right here for 0 0.025 in a single tail or 0 0.05 in total in two tails. So I'll line that up and my answer is 1.972 according to this. 1.972. Alright, and I should get the same answer or close to the same answer using Excel. So I'm going to do that here with t dot two tails, always two tails, for confidence intervals, and then put in, oh, make sure to do t inverse for two tails, there we go. Probability is 0 0.05, and the degrees of freedom, 221. So notice that I get 1.9701, or 0.9701. 1.971 from my P inverse two tail function. And I believe we're rounding to two places, so that should be fine either way when I answer my answer. I round to two places, so again, Either way, my answer comes out to 1.97. Okay, so those kinds of questions are um, all finished. Those are all the ones I wanted to do for us. And I will start a new video picking up from there with more 7.2 examples. See you on the next one.